Hey everybody, Chris with Xano here, and today I'm going to talk to you about syncing your Webflow CMS and your Xano database. What we're going to cover today is, of course, the initial setup. We're going to talk about building the database table that you use to sync your Webflow items. We're going to talk about the initial sync. We're going to talk about how to handle edits and deletes. And finally, we're going to talk about whether or not this is something you should even consider. There are a few gotchas here that we definitely need to go over before you consider actually enabling a sync between Webflow and Xano. So let's take a look at our project inside of Webflow. You can see I have a CMS collection with a collection of blog posts. Uh, in my pages, I just have a home page, which is just a directory of all of those blog posts. And then, of course, we have our blog post template, which is the actual post page. So in Xano, the first thing you're going to need to do is to make sure you have a table for all of this data to live. So you can see I have a blog table here. I have went ahead and created some fields that actually match the structure of my Webflow CMS. So that means that in my Webflow CMS here, if we go to the settings, we can see I have a name and a slug, post body, post summary, main and thumbnail image. I have a featured switch, and then I have a color. In my Xano database, I have name, slug, body, summary, my images, featured, and color. Um, but I also have an additional field here. This field is called post ID. You're also going to want to make sure that you have a field for this value. And this is actually also something that Webflow maintains for you. So if we look at one of our CMS items here and we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can see we have this item ID value here. This also needs to be stored inside of Xano. So you just want to make sure that you have a field for that. So once we have our table set up, we can actually go ahead and start talking about the initial sync. We need to go ahead and populate our Xano database with any of the data that we have in Webflow currently. So inside my function stack here, I'm going to walk you through step by step how we're actually getting the data from Webflow. The first thing that we're doing is we are calling the Webflow API to get the number of CMS items. So this means that we're just calling the API. We're not really getting any sets of results. We're getting one post and we're only doing that so we can actually look at the total number of items that Webflow is sending us. And I can show you exactly what that result looks like here. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see that we have our uh, first item is returned here, but we also have these four values right here. So we have a count. The count is the number of items that are currently being returned. We have a limit. This is a limit of posts for Webflow to return at one time. Uh, for this example, I just have it set to one because I only need one post so I can get these four values. However, you can have this set up to 100. There's a maximum of 100 items that you can have returned at one time. We have our offset. Offset is kind of similar to paging in that it essentially skips a certain number of records before returning you a new set. So if I had 10 items in my CMS, my limit was five, but my offset was five, we would skip those first five records and then just continue returning items from there. And then of course we have our total, which is the total number of items in this CMS collection. The next step is a precondition. This is just a step that determines whether or not there were any posts returned. If Webflow didn't return us any items, then we would display an error that says there are no new posts to get. And then we are defining a variable called current post counts, which we will use a little bit later on in the function stack. Now, the next step here is a for loop. A for loop is similar to a for each loop in that it still iterates over a set of items, but a for loop is actually a little bit different because this has a specifically set number of loop iterations. So instead of just looping over an array of objects based on how many objects there are, we only execute this loop a certain number of times. And the number of times that we execute this loop is being determined by the total number of items that the uh, first API call returned to us divided by the limit. So this is 
in a way kind of determining the number of pages of items we're going to need to pull from the Webflow API. Now, because this limit is actually pulled from that first API step, we're actually going to want to go back here and we're going to want to adjust this limit based on how many posts we actually want returned at one time. Now I am using a blog as an example for this. Uh, so I could probably set my limit a little bit higher. I could probably just not have a limit on here at all. Uh, but for the sake of the example, I'm gonna say I have a limit of 10. So it's going to essentially get 10 posts at a time. In terms of what you should set this limit to, it really just depends on your specific data set. If you have a lot of fields with a lot of information, you're probably going to want that limit to be a little bit lower, but maybe you only have a couple of fields and uh, you can go ahead and set that up to the maximum, which is again 100. So it's up to you kind of what works best for you there. So once we establish our for loop and we have that number of pages defined, we're calling the API again, and we are getting a set of posts based on that limit and the offset. The offset is this current post counts variable. So for the first step, we don't actually need an offset at all. So for the first run this loop, this is actually just zero and we'll update it a little bit later on. We then have a conditional. This conditional step basically asks, did the Webflow API return us any items? Uh, if it did not, then we will break out of this loop. That means we're done. We've went through all of the items. Uh, if the Webflow API is still returning us items, then we are looping through those items that have been returned. And this is where our logic is going to differ greatly. So what I'm doing here may not be what you have to do on your end. It really just depends on what data transformation you need to have happen for each of these posts. So in my case, because I'm populating blogs and I want the images to be stored inside of my Xano database, I have to complete a set of steps to actually get the image and create some metadata for that so it can be stored on the Xano side. You may not have to do any of this, especially if you're just using uh, text fields or something like that. You may not need any data transformation at all here. This is going to be very much dependent on your specific data. But the important step here is that we are adding that record to our blog table. So you can see we have all of our fields populated here from the uh, post that Webflow is returning. And uh, after that loop has uh, executed once, so we have our first page done here, we update that current post counts variable by adding the limit that was established. So our offset then becomes, in this example, 10, because we were returned 10 records and we want the next 10 records. So this number will just be determined by the limit that you set uh, in your original API call right here. And we'll of course make this logic available to you. There will be a link to a snippet down in the description below so you can play with this yourself. So uh, we can go ahead and uh, we'll run this and we'll actually just go ahead and populate our database table. Okay, so we have success. Let's go ahead and check our database table. And you can see we have all of our posts here straight from Webflow. All of our fields have been populated, including that post ID field. So now let's talk about how to handle edits. So in this example, let's say you have made a change on the Webflow side and you want that change to populate on the Xano side. Well, the really cool thing about this logic here is that we really only need to make one change to make that work. And that is going to be to change this add record step to a new function called add or edit record. So add or edit record will essentially search your database table for a specific record based on an ID that you specify. If that record exists, then we will just edit it if that record does not exist, then we will add a new one. So for this example, I'm going to use the post ID field here. And that field value is going to come from, uh, it looks like post dot underscore ID. So Webflow sends this value in a key called underscore ID. And I know that my uh, base variable is post because that is what my loop is using to iterate through all of the posts that are returned. And then finally, I can go ahead and quickly populate all of these fields here with my post variable. 
and I'm just need to enable uh, the fields that I want edited here. Uh, my featured, my color, my author, my main image, and my thumbnail image. Now, because I'm doing some data transformation here, my main and thumbnail image are not going to come from that post variable. They're going to come from my uh, image variables here. So that's going to be featured image data and thumbnail image data. Uh, and let's go ahead and just review this quickly and make sure we don't need to update anything else. Uh, so Webflow does not send the post body and the post summary with underscores. It sends it with uh, a dash. So we just need to go ahead and update these fields here. And we'll go ahead and save that. And I think that is all we need to change here. Uh, we can go ahead and save this and we are good to go. We can just disable our add record steps. So now this will behave exactly the same, except it will also then account for any edits that have been made on the Webflow side. And because we are using the add or edit record step, which validates whether or not we already have a post based on that post ID, we don't have to worry about getting like double posts inside of our Xeno database. Now, of course, the next thing we're going to think about here is right now we just have this, uh, it looks like in a custom function. What if we want this to run at a specific cadence? So maybe we want to uh, update our Xeno database every morning or uh, 10 times a day or you know once every five minutes or whatever you wanna do there. Uh, what we can actually do is we'll go ahead and save our changes and we can actually populate this inside of a background task, which is right here. So because we have our logic built in a custom function, which is just reusable logic that you can use in multiple places inside Xano, uh, we can enable this background task to run on uh, any kind of schedule that's, uh, that we prefer. So we can pick a, a starting date and time, and we can tell this to repeat on uh, whatever frequency we need, which is pretty cool. So this will execute that logic on the uh, specific cadence that we set here and keep our uh, Xano database up to date. So now we're going to talk about deletes. So what if we want to delete a post and make sure that it is gone from both sides? That's actually going to be handled uh, on the Webflow side. So if we go back to our blog post page here, you can see if we go ahead and just preview this, we have a delete this post button down at the bottom of the page. And this, this, and this button will delete the post not only from Xano, but also Webflow at the same time. So let's go back to our page here and I will show you that custom code. Uh, this will of course also be made available uh, in the description below. So we are using the Xano JavaScript SDK, which even if you're not somebody that is familiar with JavaScript, uh, this definitely makes your life a lot easier, especially when building these integrations with Webflow. So in these first few lines of code, we're actually just loading and initializing the Xano JavaScript SDK. This next line of code is looking for that delete button on our page. And then we are adding an event listener to that button. So that means we are basically just waiting for that button to be clicked. When that button is clicked, we are looking at the URL of the current page that we're on, and we're getting the slug of the post. Now let me show you. So if we look at our page URL, our page URL has of course the Webflow domain, it has slash post, and then another slash, and then it has some text. For this page, it is how to improve web design process. So that is the slug of our post, and that's what we're going to be using to determine which post to actually delete and we're deleting that post in a Xano API. So we're actually calling a Xano API here to handle the delete on both sides. So let me show you what this Xano API looks like. So there are a couple of different things happening here. The first thing we're doing is we are getting that record from our blog table based on that post slug. We are sending an API request to Webflow. This first request is actually going to unpublish the post from the CMS. Now we have to do this first because if we were just going to delete the post, um, what would happen on the Webflow side is that that post would still appear live 
on the site until we actually publish again. And we definitely want to make sure to automate that if we can. So we're going to uh, push an unpublish action using the Webflow API, and then we actually delete the post from the Webflow CMS. Now, if you wanted to only have the post unpublished and not deleted, you can just comment this step out or not build it. Uh, whatever you wanna do there is totally fine. The important thing is that it doesn't show up on the live site. So once we have made those two calls to the Webflow API, we are then deleting the record from the blog table. So we can actually just take a look at that in action. Let's go ahead and delete this post. This is called how to improve web design process. We'll click delete this post. And uh, we did get a little pop-up that said this post has been deleted from Xano and Webflow. That's actually part of our custom code right here. We have this alert that shows when the call was made. And then we are redirected back to the main page. Now, is the post that we were just looking at still here? So we are looking for how to improve web design process. And we can see that this is gone on the Webflow side. We can confirm by going to our CMS. And we can see that is gone from here. And we can also then see in the Xano database, it looks like that was a record number five because we're skipping right from four to six. So that record is now gone from the Xano side as well. So we have fully handled that delete on both sides. Now this is where things get a little bit tricky because I do just want to talk to you about whether or not you should even consider building a sync between your Webflow CMS and your Xano database. As you can see, while we did essentially accomplish what we were looking for, there's a big missing piece here. That missing piece is what if we edit something on the Xano side and we want to push that to Webflow? How does that work? Well, we could build another API request to actually update those items. However, if we were to build that flow, what we would actually end up with is two separate flows that would essentially be kind of fighting with each other in terms of one staying up to date over the other. While we can build the functionality to kind of make that work, it's not a true sync. And that is because we're limited in essentially what we can do with the Webflow API. For example, if I was able to only call post content from the Webflow API from posts that I don't have in the Xano database, that would greatly improve the efficiency of what we're doing. And it would be something that I could then uh, potentially recommend as a good option in terms of keeping these databases in sync. And then we would think about deletes as well. If we delete something from this database view in Xano, what happens on the Webflow side? Nothing. We would need to then query all of the items that we have in our Webflow CMS, match them to what we have in our database table, and then delete those from the Webflow side. Now, that is, again, possible. It's 100% possible just based on the logic that you've seen here today and we provided in the snippet for you down in the description. However, this isn't really going to be a great solution once your data set grows. You know, here I only have about 15 records that I'm working with, but what happens when you have 5,000 records or 10,000 records? It's not going to be very performant or very efficient to query the entire data set to make changes. So essentially what I'm saying is, while this is a valid approach for some of you, it may not be for all of you. And it's definitely going to be worthwhile to consider whether or not setting up a sync like this makes sense. What typically makes more sense is for all of your data to live in one place. And of course, you are on Zeno's YouTube channel, so I am going to recommend that you consider all of your data living in Xano. And I definitely understand that when you're using Xano and Webflow together, this quickly becomes very much not a no code solution because you do typically have to utilize custom code to make this work. And that's why I'm also going to leave a link down in the description to WISD. WISD is a fantastic tool that really helps facilitate and make so much easier your connection between Webflow and your Xano database. And we have more content coming with them in the near future, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, but I definitely recommend checking that out because having all of your data live in one place, it's going to make your life a lot easier. It's going to make sure that you don't have to worry about the efficiency of the syncs that are being performed. And it's going to give you the peace of mind of knowing that all of your data lives only in one place so you don't have to handle the management of multiple data sets. 
And also your data is then portable. So you're building a Webflow site right now, but maybe you want to go use Bravo Studio to build a native mobile application. Well, all you'd have to do then is connect your Xano backend to your Bravo Studio application and you'd be set. So there are a lot of advantages to making sure that your data lives in one place. But for this specific example, it's really all about speed and efficiency. Thank you so much for watching. I know that this topic has a lot of nuance to it, so please let me know if you have any questions either down in the comments below, or you can find me on the Xano community or reach out to us via Xano support chat. Be sure to keep an eye out for more Xano content in the future, and we will see you in the next one.